Thank you very much, and thank you so much for the invitation uh, to be here. Um, it's yeah, it's amazing to come back here after uh, the Kathmandu Triennale last year, and the festival is very inspiring to me. And I've seen a lot of interesting work and talks and and uh, the exchange. So I'm really happy to be here, and I'm happy to share some of my own work. Um, I'm going to start um, with a little visual haiku or visual verbal haiku and then I'll start properly. So this is a dedication, um, like we find it at the beginning of a book, perhaps. Um, it's a dedication to an ancient cross-species collaboration, an association between plants and fungi, uh, which takes place at the roots of most plants, about 90% of all plants, and which is the basis of all life. Um, mycorrhiza are usually invisible, and they form a part of the underground root systems, and they create an intricate web of exchange of nutrients, but also allow plants, and trees in particular, to communicate with each other underground. Um, usually it's shown as a five-channel video installation. But this was just the dedication, so I'm going to start properly now. And I wanted to just say a few words about the title, um, which I've chosen for this talk, Conversing with Leaves and Listening to Ghosts. Perhaps starting with listening to ghosts um, is something that has always accompanied me 
as an artist, but also as a person in the world. Um, I suppose um, it's marked my practice from a very early stage um, through my family history of trauma and loss in relation to the Holocaust. And I also worked around this initially in my practice. Uh, but I felt the urgency over time to extend the, the conversation or the listening to ghosts and the thinking about trauma um, to extend that um, to a larger chorus of ghosts, I suppose, and to think more broadly, but still very specifically, about entanglements across time entanglements across colonial and post-colonial geographies. And I'll talk about ghosts uh, a bit more uh, later. And then conversing with leaves is something that started a few years ago when I started to get interested in human plant entanglements in, I suppose, our existence our existence in the world um, in more than human ways, and to think about plants specifically um, as actors in history and politics rather than just as backdrop. And I think plants are usually the last form of life we think about. Um, and we think about animals having some kind of agency. They have movement, they kill, they do things. Uh, we can see them, we can see them interact. We don't see much about that with plants. That's also why I, why I chose to show this video at the beginning, dedication, because it's also about what is visible and what is not visible. And plants are quite interesting in relation to, to questions of representation because they don't show everything immediately. So we don't see this collaboration between plants and fungi at the root system because it's underground. We don't see plants move much, but they do. Um, so that's kind of the thinking I started to have um, a few years ago. And I guess these two conversations interact very much. And that's really what I'm going to talk about, the interaction between uh, this thinking about uh, human plant entanglements and uh, listening to ghosts. And I've organized the talk in sort of chapters, as it were. I don't quite know why, maybe just to make it a bit easier to organize the material. I'm going to show quite a few works. Some of them I'm going to speak about in more detail, and some of them I will speak about um, maybe uh, faster. So I want to think about vegetal witnessing first. What does that mean? How can we think about more than human witnessing? How can we think about plants as witnesses? And what form of witnessing would that take? Um, I was working in South Africa a few years ago, over, over a number of years. And th through, through the research I conducted there, I became more and more aware of trees that had a very specific involvement in history. So, for example, I found this tree, a wild almond tree, that was planted in 1660 when the first Europeans arrived in South Africa. Um, it was the Dutch East India Company that organized trade trips from the Indies to the Netherlands. Um, and um, would bring back uh, things, of course, and uh, since they had to sail around Africa, it was a very long journey, and they were lacking in fresh provisions, which resulted in vitamin C deficiency and scurvy. So they went ashore at the Cape looking for a place where they could grow fruit and vegetables. And uh, the climate at the Cape is sort of Mediterranean. So one of the first things which they did when they landed at the Cape was not so much to kind of create a colony as such, but to create a garden. It's called the company's garden, the VOC's garden, 
Um, and it was, it was meant to replenish the ships. But the land on which the garden was planted was not, not empty. It was used by the indigenous Kwekwe population who also had grazing cattle. And the cattle was also happy eating some of the vegetables and salads. So they planted this wild almond tree as a hedge, as a kilometer long hedge around this garden, these fields, in order to prevent uh, the cattle of the local population to, uh, uh, to access the garden. So in a sense, we could say that one of the first acts of colonial violence was actually the planting of this garden, of this, of this hedge, of this, of this tree, this wild almond tree. And it's still here today. A part of this hedge, a part of this tree is still here. Um, so it's become a sort of inadvertent monument and witness to, to, to this colonial history and violence. Um, but the tree is not, um, is not exactly a material witness that we can ventriloquize in order to tell a story because nothing is marked there. So I was sort of thinking about how this tree or plants or trees in particular can be considered as part of what maybe we could think about as an articulate collective of human and non-human speech, um, in which traces from the past haunt the present and demand a response. And this is precisely what, what a ghost is. It's a trace from the past, it's a return from the past, it's a haunting which comes back to demand a response, to demand justice. So ghosts, even if we think about sort of popular culture and zombie films, when we have a ghost in a, say, a haunted house, um, it's because a crime was committed, a child was killed, and no justice had been done, and therefore the ghost comes back to demand justice. So I'm interested in this idea of ghosts as unfinished business from the past, as something that is still here, that lingers, that is in the past and in the present, but we might not recognize it as such. Um, so this tree, for example, um, is referred to as Ruth Fisher tree. It doesn't have a mark, it doesn't have a sign, it doesn't have anything. But it's in Johannesburg, and it used to stand next to the house, house of Ruth Fisher, who was an anti-apartheid activist. And she gave her house as a safe house for fugitives from, from uh, the apartheid security forces. So when somebody was on the run, they would be told, oh, you should try to get to Ruth Fisher's house, look out for this tall poplar tree, and her house is right next to it. So this tree literally saved lives. Um, this tree here um, is a milkwood tree um, that uh, is also in Cape Town. It used to be on the beachfront, but the sea has shifted. And it used, to be, it used to be called the old slave tree of Woodstock. And slaves uh, were sold there. Uh, slaves who were disobedient and tried to run away were hung there. And later on, after the war between the British and the Boer, a uh, treaty was signed which effectively handed over the whole Cape Connolly um, from the Dutch to the British. Um, so this is, it's a whole series uh, which is called The Memory of Trees. Um, and you can see that they are taken in negatives. They're actually medium format negatives that I printed as negatives. And I suppose materially I was, I've been quite interested in the negative because it shows us a kind of latency. It shows us an image that is not completely ready to be viewed. And I've been thinking for quite a long time about archives, um, 
which which are not necessarily housed in buildings in in proper archives, but which are embedded in the landscape, which are embedded in places, in buildings. Um, and I call them latent archives. And latent, in this sense, means that it's there, but it's not necessarily visible. And photography, or rather analog photography, is one of the best examples of this kind of latency. Because we, we have a negative film, which is exposed and light kind of hits uh, surface with emulsion, with light sensitive emulsion, and an image is inscribed on the film, but it's not visible yet. It needs to be processed in order to become visible. So we have a latent image on the film, it's there, but it needs to be processed. Um, so in my work, I've been interested in this notion of latency and how we can we can apply it or think about places as latent archives or landscapes or plants or trees as latent archives or documents which need to be processed in order for their histories to be accessed. Um, I'm going to move on to another project that I also developed in South Africa, um, Grey Green Gold. And it's sort of not thinking about a single plant, but it's thinking about how a garden might be an active sort of part in history, an actor in history. Um, and I'm, I'm quite aware, actually, as I speak, I'm sort of aware how um, the sort of motto of this festival is, is to do with these kind of storytellings, more than human storytellings. And so how can a garden tell a story or how uh, is a garden involved in histories? So this garden um, was made in the court of uh, Robben Island Prison where Mandela and his fellow inmates were held um, for almost 20 years. Um, and at some point they were allowed to to cultivate a small patch of land at the end, against the wall at the very end. And the cultivation of this land, very small patch of land, was not just about plants. It was not just about kind of what they grew, but it was also about how they could create a connection with the land. And it also played a role a role in history. So the work itself is um, an installation. It's a little bit complex. It has this part, which is a wallpaper and a slide projection of text. And then there's another part. So it's this image. And then we have a slide projection that tells the story of the garden as it was told to me by two fellow inmates of Mandela who were still alive at the time, Lalu Chiba and Ahmed Katrada. Um, who were involved in setting up the garden. So it begins to tell the story, but actually what happens later on is that, for example, um, while Mandela was in prison, he wrote the script of uh, the book uh, Long Road to Freedom, which is a biography of his life, um, which was buried in the garden and survived because it was buried in the garden. So the garden sort of played a role in relation to that script as well. And there is another story, that of a Strelitzia flower, um, which uh, looks like this usually, um, and they're native flowers in South Africa, and they grew across Robben Island in Cape Town in the Botanical Garden, um, and usually they're orange, but around the time when Mandela and his fellow inmates arrived in prison, um, they found a few yellow flowers. And they were very excited about that in the Botanical Garden. And they started a program of sort of um, where they sort of hand 
pollinated these yellow flowers to create a new cultivar, a yellow strelitzia. Um, and it took almost 20 years to create this new, new cultivar, this new plant, exactly the time that Mandela was in prison. And after he left prison and eventually was elected the first president of South Africa of a kind of, uh, um, of an, uh, a, a non-apartheid South Africa, um, the botanical garden named this flower Mandela's gold, um, sort of in his honor. Of course, it was not uh, planned to be like that. Um, but there is a problem uh, because the land on which the Botanic National Botanical Garden of South Africa um, is planted was land that belonged to the British colonialist Cecil Rhodes, um, who you might have heard of, um, who had huge colonial aspirations from Cairo to the Cape, mostly in Africa, and even a country named after him, Rhodesia, today's Zimbabwe. And he owned this patch of land and had a lodge there. And when he lived there, um, he was nostalgic for the British squirrel and had imported it. And this British squirrel uh, liked it there and still lives there. And it likes the seed of this flower. So if this flower is left alone, it, uh, the squirrel, the British squirrel, would eat its seeds and the yellow flower uh, would not be able to continue. So what they do is they put Mandela's gold in a cage after it's flowered in a sort of twist of irony um, in order to protect it from the European predator, the squirrel. Um, so I guess that's one of the ways also how colonial histories persist. You bring an animal or a plant from one place t to another place and it stays there, it lives there, um, and it has consequences that reach into the present. Um, so the second part of the installation consists of this photograph and the seed of the flower. Which is quite a beautiful seed with orange, a tuft of orange hair. Even the yellow flower has orange hair on the seed. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the second chapter, uh, Contesting Histories. Um, and I'm going to stay in the National Botanical Garden in Cape Town. Um, I started doing more research there, and I asked them if they have a photographic or film archive in the library of the Botanical Garden. And they said, we don't, but we have a cellar, and there are some boxes with photographs and films there. So I went into the cellar, and I found a box with 12 film rolls, um, from 1963, which apparently had not been watched since then. And I asked them if I can transfer this material to digital um, in order to see what it is. And also I would, of course, make the copy accessible in the library itself. And when I watched these films, I kind of realized they were all commissioned for the 50th anniversary of the Botanical Garden in 1963. And we only saw white visitors. The only black people in the films were the workers. Um, we saw these kind of celebrations of um, the Botanical Garden with flower dances by kids and national dances, which were Dutch dances, of course. Um, and we also saw, uh, we can also see in the films um, uh, quite a lot of international visitors because the Cape is one of the eight floral kingdoms in the world. It has a huge amount of uh, plant variety. Um, 
So what was happening in the films were sort of two things. One that could be called botanical nationalism, how plants are being used in order to create a sense of national belonging, how plants are instrumentalized um, in order to create this sense of nation. This is our land. These are our plants, um, which was very much what the, the apartheid South African regime as a colonial settler regime was trying to do to appropriate the land and the plants, the plants on the land. Um, and the second thing was something that could be called flower diplomacy, where plants and flowers were actively used by the South African regime um, to do what we now would call greenwashing, to kind of create a benign image of South Africa at a time when it was an extremely violent, oppressive, discriminatory regime that the majority of the population had no rights, um, it would use plants to promote itself as this beautiful place. And interestingly, even though there was, uh, there was a boycott um, internationally that tried to that tried to isolate South Africa, um, which included things like art and culture. Um, flowers and plants were excluded from the boycott or were just not thought about because plants are nothing. They're just around. Nobody thought they have any weight as such. So South Africa used plants actively to promote itself and take part in things like the Chelsea Flower Show in London and the New York Flower Show and win prizes and to invite um, international botanists to see this beautiful place. Um, so I was, I was faced with this archive of films and I had the sense that it should be shown, it should become visible again in some ways, it should be allowed to return, but of course, um, it's an extremely problematic archive of images. It's extremely problematic images. And so I was wondering how we can intervene in the archive. Um, I think as artists, uh, we are often seduced by the archive. There is a kind of seduction in archival images, in their quality, in, in the sort of access that they might provide to another time. And there is also a kind of trap, I think, of archival images um, uh, sort of in general, which is that they provide a kind of window into the past. But of course, they provide a very selective window, and, and we need to do something with that. So, so I was wondering how, how I can intervene in this archive. Um, how, in a sense, through this archive, maybe um, I can imagine a parallel past, an alternative past, and not the one that is actually depicted. So I, I started collaborating with a friend of mine, an actor, uh, Lindiwe Machikiza, and she knew the botanical garden very well because her mother happened to be the first black CEO of the, of the Botanical Institute of South Africa, of which the garden is a part, but she had never seen these films either. So we decided to project the films and for her to step into them, to inhabit them, and to confront them, to confront uh, the images, and, and, and I, I guess produce alternative images or an alternative path that is recounted through the images. So, the film is called The Fairest Heritage, which is also the title of one of the films that I found, which is, I guess, an unintended wordplay because fair means beautiful, but it also means just, um, and it also means light, light-skinned. 
So one could say, what does all this have to do with me? Um, and I guess it has a lot to do with me. It has a lot to do with, um, with Europe in general, in that these histories, I don't see them as something that is, is completely past, and the geographies are not completely separate. So what I'm interested in, I guess, is the entanglement across time, across past and present, but also across geographies. Um, so trying to think about this kind of continuing exchange where once you have something like a colonial history, it's not, it, um, it's not simply over, but the entanglements continue. And in my case in particular, I grew up in Zurich, which you can see here. And in the summers, the lake of Zurich was always surrounded by beautiful red geraniums. In fact, geraniums were something of a sort of national flower in Switzerland. They would trail from balconies of chalets in the mountains. And they were, as I said, almost considered a national flower. So again, we have something like botanical nationalism. However, as I grew up, I didn't know, and I don't think many people in general know, that what we see here on the left are not geraniums, and they're not Swiss. They're actually pelargoniums, and they first came from South Africa. The Dutch East India Company brought them from South Africa to Europe to satisfy the hunger of the kind of new horticultural industry um, around the aristocracy at the time that wanted new exotic plants for their, for their gardens. And so it was misidentified as a geranium. And initially, it was called African geranium. And it was a big hit. And it expanded its reach all over Europe and all over the world eventually. Um, and eventually, uh, the African adjective was dropped, and it was just geraniums. Um, and when it was discovered that actually they're not geraniums, but they're pelargoniums, um, it was too late. And all the garden centers said, we're not going to change the name. They're our best sellers, and we keep the name. So they're still known as geraniums. And in fact, geraniums are never red. There are no red geraniums, but there are red pelargoniums, as we can see here. And they really have traveled uh, across the world. So I've started to become slightly obsessed with geraniums and collecting postcards. And so I made this work called Geraniums I Never Read, which essentially is a postcard collection, one of which is blown up sort of as a, as a larger than life-size image. In this case, we see um, a geranium field in California and it's accompanied by a postcard stand um, with a selection from the geranium archive that is reproduced and people can take with them. So some of the postcards. Um, yeah, and, and there is a text on the back. Um, OK. Um, next kind of thought is around this notion of restituting knowledges. Um, in fact, the, my interest in plants as political actors and as witnesses of history started um, with a walk in the botanical garden in Cape Town, which you can see here. Um, and it was completely accidental. I just wandered into it. And I was really struck by the plant labels. Um, so South Africa has 11 official national languages, but it has more than that that are spoken. And all the plant labels are in Latin and English. So um, one national language, English, and Latin is not even a national language. So. I was struck by what this means and what this kind of opens up 
um, in terms of uh, the history of of our engagement with these plants, and it sort of it sort of uh, leads us back to to the beginnings of colonial history when Europeans arrived in South Africa and elsewhere, and embarked on scientific expeditions to chart the new territories and to discover resources, new resources that could be exploited, whether they are mineral or vegetal. Um, and so you'd have botanists, European botanists, um, travel on these expeditions and they would find new plants, so-called new plants, um, which were new to them, but which were, of course, already known to the local population. And the plants were being named often after the botanists themselves. So here we have Gasteria Rollinsonii. So some guy called Rollinson uh, was the first to discover this, supposedly, and named it after himself using this Latin taxonomy, this Latin classification system that was instigated by Linnaeus, a Swedish botanist, who created the system where all species, all living matter, um, is organized in, in families, in, in genuses, and in species, in the individual spe um, species. So it's a very particular system of organizing the world, of classifying it, um, which is very much connected to a kind of European rationalism and an enlightenment, uh, enlightenment project of understanding and classifying and organizing the world. Um, and it was, it has been exported all over the world as a universal system. And it's still being used in universities across the world. And of course, it's not a neutral system. It's a very specific system. You can organize the world in different ways, or you cannot have the need to organize and classify all the plants and all the living beings in this way in the first place. Um, so there is a kind of violence of classification, of taxonomy, but there is also an epistemic violence, a violence of a kind of suppression of existing knowledge, the existing names that these plants had, um, which are not recorded and which are sidelined, maybe because they're in oral history, but also, of course, because they come from a local population and not the European population. Um, so when I speak about entanglements, it's also this. These plant names persist. This epistemic violence persists. It's still with us. And we often kind of, or quite a few people are thinking about um, sort of mechanisms of decolonization and it's something very complicated. How do we decolonize knowledge? What do we do with knowledge when it's still colonized? So one of the things that I started to do in response to this experience of the botanical garden was travel throughout South Africa and record plant names in over a dozen uh, local indigenous languages, um, which became an audio plant dictionary, what plants were called before they had a name, um, uh, which is literally plant names in lots of different languages, and is presented as speakers hanging from the ceiling. Um, I can just hear a bit. And as you could see, the, the sound work, what plants were called before they had a name, is accompanied by these overhead projectors, um, which is a work called Echoes, where we see spectral images 
um, of the plant specimens that were collected in these botanical expeditions and dried and pressed and stored in, in, in the, the, the herbaria and in a sense and, and uh, created over time an image of themselves on the covering page. So we see this, this ghostly spectral image which refuses to be subsumed or objectified within the classificatory system of botany that seeks to master it. And so here we have these kind of imprint traces, ghostly images, which become more poetic than scientific, um, which become more evocative than, than forensic or classificatory, because we can't be sure exactly what what plant it is. And this work continued with, with another project in Guatemala, which is the work that I'm showing here, um, where I found a book um, from the Indigenous Institute of the University in Guatemala, which showed, which collected medicinal plants, Mayan medicinal plants, and their uses. And as you can see, there is a drawing of the plant on the top left. It says what the plant is used for. And then below is its name, but only in Spanish, in the, in, in the colonizer's language. And yet what we see is plants that are used in indigenous Mayan medicine. So I took this book and I started to travel through, through Guatemala and show it to... Um, um, indigenous healers and who, are, who, who identified the plants and basically annotated the book, wrote the Mayan uh, names in the book. So again, this question of how do we intervene in an archive? How do we change documents? How do we sort of say, this is not a fixed thing. We can still intervene in it. We can still intervene in the past for the sake, of course, of the present and the future. So it becomes a multilingual, uh, it becomes a multilingual publication. And I guess what I've been interested in for a long time is this, this connection between um, what what might be called cultural diversity or linguistic diversity in relation to biodiversity, and that we can't think the two as separate things. Um, we need to think basically about coexistence across languages, across cultures, and across uh, human, non-human worlds. So this is in Kapinje, if you haven't been yet. Um, I'm not going to talk about the next work because we're, we don't have a lot of time, which is a project called Reading Wood Backwards about a wood library in Lisbon. Um, again, an archive of sorts, quite complicated. Uh, you just maybe see some images of it. Um, but I'm not going to uh, explain much more because I want to move on. Actually, I'm not going to talk about this either. Um, sorry. I think I was too optimistic with time. So, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. We can go back to things if you want. <laughs> Um, but I want to go to the last chapter, which is called Learning from Plants and from Each Other, um, and which will also will lead us to the film. Um, so maybe just very, very quickly about a project I did in London, uh, which was called Communal Herbal Knowledge, where I worked um, for an exhibition, I guess a year ahead of the exhibition, with various local communities around the art space where the exhibition was going to be. And there was a really mixed community. And I was interested in uh, what kind of plant knowledge, medicinal plant knowledge, was harbored in this community where there's um, a kind of, um, there were communities from Bangladesh, from Sudan, from 
from uh, various parts of the world. Um, and we had meetings and we basically collected uh, this sort of information through stories of, oh, my grandmother would give me this when I had a headache. My grandmother would give me this when I had a sore throat. And we collected all this kind of communal knowledge from different communities, but in shared meetings. And we ended up with quite a big list of 50 plants, which we then thought it would be nice to actually plant and make a garden. So we collaborated with an old people's home and a lot of the people also from the meetings. And we set out um, to make a garden. Um, a communal herbal knowledge garden um, with these plants. And you just see a few images here. We wanted it to be a bit like a botanical garden, so we thought it has to have labels. But of course, labels are, as you could see, are quite problematic. So our labels were a bit different. They focused on what the plant was used for, and then they had plant names in different languages. So we usually had four names around. Uh, kind of in the corners, but the center of it was really um, what the plant, what a plant is doing. And then we also had workshops um, on how to use the plants, um, uh, which were really inspiring to make tinctures and creams and lots of things. And we made a small publication called Communal Herbal Knowledge, a kind of Rezo print publication. Uh, which consisted of four little booklets for various parts of the body. Again, we didn't want it to be alphabetical or organized. We wanted it to be organized uh, kind of a, around the body. And on one side were the plants that we literally just photocopied. And on the other side were, were various uses. And I made another garden. Also, I'm not going to be able to talk a lot about it, but I made another garden. I made a few gardens over time, but I'll just briefly mention one that I made in Lubumbashi in Congo with a collective of 40 women who are cultivating a plant called Artemisia afra, uh, which looks like this, and which is extremely effective against malaria, but the World Health Organization does not, um, does not support its use. Uh, because it's a uh, because it's a herbal it's a herbal medicine and it can't be controlled in the way that pills can, because the pharmaceutical industry also is involved in the World Health Organization, and would ob obviously has interests. Um, yeah, it's quite a complicated history, and it's also interesting because it's in Congo, and Congo is one of the most extracted uh, places in the world. All our computers have have metals from Congo. And I started to realize that our relationship to plants, our kind of through plants as medicine, is very similar to our relationship to the planet as a whole and the extraction of resources. In that usually we look for the active ingredients, pharmaceutical companies look for the active ingredient of a plant, extract it, and then ideally try to synthesize it and basically discard everything else. And this is what happens in the pits. You take out the mineral you need and you don't care about the society around, the landscape, the environment. Um, and quite a lot of work had been done in Congo and also the local art scene is very much engaged with the pits and with this form of extraction. But uh, uh, not so much thinking around kind of how plants also, also interact with that. Um, and in fact, what was interesting is that one of the reasons why the World Health Organization is against the use of this plant is that a sister plant called Artemisia annua, which actually comes from China um, and had been used for centuries against fever in China, was sort of discovered during the Vietnam War because uh, the Chinese um, would supply the Viet Cong with, uh, this, um, with the tea of this of this plant, and uh, and as a consequence, the kind of uh, the presence of malaria was much lower uh, for the Viet Cong than for the Americans. So after the war, there was this kind of race to figure out why does this plant work against malaria, and they identified this molecule, which they called artemisinin, and 
the person who identified who identified it won a Nobel Prize for it. Um, and it's being used essentially in the, the kind of last generation of medication against malaria, which uses this ingredient and two others. So this plant from Africa that is also called Artemisia, but it's a different, it's a different plant, um, would, would perhaps interfere, would, um, would, also make, uh, would also perhaps make people resistant, was, was the argument of the World Health Organization. But in fact, it's the extraction of an individual ingredient that creates resistance because the parasite can adapt to it um, and, and change and mutate and then become uh, resistant to it. Whereas Artemisia afra actually does not contain this ingredient. So it cannot lead to resistance of the other one. Um, and we don't know why it works. So we decided to to kind of promote this more in the city because this um, is in a very rural area and even in Lubumbashi, in the nearest city, people don't know much about it because it's, it's, not, it's not been supported by the government or the World Health Organization. There aren't projects. So we did a, a sort of, we had to resort to guerrilla gardening as it were, and we made this garden of Artemisia afra and a mural and this eventually, eventually became um, sort of a film um, about extraction um, in all kinds of ways, including images, thinking about the kind of extraction of images. Um, so the film also became quite complicated, and so it, was, it became more like a letter, and a lot of images were not shown. And I also collaborated with um, local musicians, and we we created a song um, for Artemisia, um, which I don't know if we have time. Maybe just one minute. I love the that produce a that in Africa, in Europe, in America, the malaria. Chronic. It's Artemisia Afra. Et l'artémisia amoureux qui vient du Vietnam et de la Chine. C'est une grande histoire et si Orient vous pourra vous parler encore. Mais c'est l'orchestre ces jeunes étoiles d'Artemisia qui vous chante maintenant la chanson, la meilleure chanson d'Artemisia Afra. a few questions. This is sort of maybe the end of the first part. Uh, the, the film is connected to this. Um, but maybe before screening the film, if there are any questions, we can also do questions at the end, I guess. But Yeah, let's take a few minutes. Firstly, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Uriel, for that. Um, and we will go into the film next. But um, I'm just, you know, so, you know, we, we were feeling so bad to invite you to just show that one small piece of your work here <laughs> because you have such a wide and deep practice. And it's just been, I think these last two years, we've just been, you know, learning more about all this. And so it was just so inspiring to, um, encounter your work here at the Triennale last year and then to meet in Kochi and get to know more about your work. You did that talk for us there. Um, and then today, I, I wish we had more time to go into your full presentation. <laughs> I feel like we sped through quite a bit. Um, but yeah, thank you for taking up our, on our invitation and showing work. If you have not visited it, uh, the work is at Kopinche, as Uriel said. Um, Questions, uh, thoughts, we'll take a few minutes. 
Um, I have one if no one else does. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to go for mine. It's quite a lot of material as well, too. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we are going to Chitwan on Friday, mm. and we do have this one activity planned, which you will also be there uh, for, which I'm very, very happy about. Um, and as we were working on preparing for the festival this time, we had a, a friend named um, Sanjeev Choudhury, who is a researcher um, himself and has done quite a bit of work on indigenous knowledge. He runs his own blog called Tharu Voice and uh, writes and um, does many other kinds of communication work. And as we were talking about um, also the work that KTK Belt is mm. doing, which is also showing next to your work, um, he brought something up which really, you know, brought something, uh, sur made something surface for me, which is this challenge. He was saying that on the one hand, all of us are sort of rallying to create more um, visibility and, and value for indigenous forms of knowledge, etc. And on the other hand, he's from an area in the southern belt in the east part of Nepal, where which is a border area to India, and that we have an open border with India. And across the border, there's a lot of also commercial information that is coming in. Um, booklets in the form of small booklets you can buy for 5, 10, 15, 20 rupees, not very expensive booklets, uh, which also give you a lot of this home remedy stuff, information, mm. you know. Mm. And so he was saying there's so much confusion about, well, what does then, what is indigenous knowledge or what is like actual you know, how, how do you trust, or, or that's how people feel, then if I pick up a booklet and buy this, are they trying to sell me a product? It could be like an Ayurvedic product, it mm. could be any kind of a medication. I was just wondering if some of those conversations are also happening in South Africa or other places where you've been working, in Guatemala, for example, and what that terrain is like, um, has been like in your research process. Mm, I mean, it's yeah. There are a lot of important questions there, and in fact, the film that we're going to see, which is part of a trilogy, is also partly about that. Thinking about like who this knowledge belongs to, how does it get disseminated, who tries to extract it as a form of knowledge and make benefit from it, um, and yeah, and sort of what happens when plants become pharmaceuticals and. And I think it's really complicated because indigenous knowledge is not owned in the way in the way we think of ownership because it's again it's 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 a communal knowledge it's an ancestral knowledge um, so which is meant to be passed on often in very specific ways of like healers to other healers. But then, of course, also people have their own knowledge. Once you've been told by a healer to take this, you might continue buying it or looking for it and taking it. So it's, it's, it's really complicated. Um, and I think it's, it's important to think about these questions. There isn't an easy answer because we want a kind of access to it. And in fact, the film that we're going to see is really about this, where, where there is a kind of... Um, there is a drive after what is called the Nagoya Protocol, the UN Nagoya Protocol from 92, to protect indigenous knowledge and biodiversity, um, which gives states the power to, I guess, to persecute or to fine pharmaceuticals that, that try to access information and, and extract it and do something with it. Um, but how do you do that? And in the film, we'll see there is a, we'll see a government official like a character in the film that proposes to create an archive of all of it and so that it's like in a safe place. But indigenous knowledge is not made for an archive. It lives in the community. It lives in people's minds and lives. Um, and at the same time, I think these sort of pamphlets and local um, sort of usage is... Is, is, is just an extension of how they've been used for a long time, perhaps. Um, what becomes more problematic is when something becomes a sort of, is hailed as a miracle cure, and then it gets like over-harvested, and 
and it gets threatened. It's the, 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 the actual survival of the plant becomes threatened, which is the case of a plant in South Africa, uh, which is called Hudia, which was discovered to have been used in the Karoo, um, which is a desert area, um, by people when they couldn't find food, when food was scarce. Um, an anthropologist kind of documented this for quite a long time until somebody thought, oh, so it's used when food is scarce, so it's an appetite suppressant. Oh, so it can be used by, by people in the US who want to lose weight. Um, and so, and it's never been able to be synthesized, and there was this kind of craze around it, and, and it nearly got extinct through that. Um, and people tried also to patent it, and we'll, we'll hear about it. So, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah. We have the whole Yorta Gumba story here, which I'm sure you've been hearing about. Mm. Yeah. Questions? Anyone? Thoughts? communities, the Mayans, and then Africa as well. How open are people to sharing this knowledge? Because you're just talking about these, uh, I mean, cases. And we also see it in, in places where we live, like, for instance, in Goa and rural areas, where there, you know, there's this over, there's this foraging of certain finger millets or, mm. you know, grains mm. that suddenly people mm. find out, oh, they can be used for different medicinal purposes, et cetera, et cetera. So how open is the sharing process really because mm, you said it's a mm. way of life right and totally yeah. totally i mean i'm very much aware also of my position as a european coming there and the history of europeans <laughs> coming to different places so i try not to repeat the kind of extractive mode and so for example in all the work that i did in south africa and i've made a lot of work also with with healers we won't be able to see it all but um we don't ever reveal like medicinal information, for example. I never ask things like that. Um, and so for me, it's much more about intervening, I suppose, in the dominant Western forms of knowledge and their kind of oppressive structures. So in this publication, how can we intervene in this publication that excluded indigenous knowledge without extracting indigenous knowledge, but actually sort of attacking or adding to or layering the printed page, um, which discarded other forms of knowledge, which was oral. And, um, and in, in the case of the first iteration of this work, what plants were called before they had a name, we just hear the plant names. And often people tell me, oh, it would be interesting if you made a slideshow and we can see the plant. But the point is precisely not to, to identify necessarily this plant is called this, but to just say, this exists. Listen, it's there. We just need to listen and pay attention. And, and, and also not necessarily to operate in this kind of enlightenment mode of revelation but allow also what Edward Glisser uh, calls the right to opacity for this knowledge to remain opaque. And we just hear these names and we don't have access to it. We, we remain outside and that is my position and, 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 and I want to acknowledge that. So it's not for me about gaining access. It's also about being excluded from something or not having access but still acknowledging it exists rather than sweeping it under the carpet. I think we, oh. Thank you, that was wonderful sharing. I'm just wondering um, how all the different locations you've worked in have come about. Um, uh, are they through art projects or personal life or, mm. yeah, how does kind of the geography of where you've worked unfold? That's an interesting question and I'm always worried about this kind of presentation because it's like like 10 years of work in different locations and it looks like I'm just like quickly going somewhere and coming back and it's, it's really not like that. I think it's a really important question. Most of the time, 
almost all of the time it comes about through an invitation. I don't decide to go somewhere and do something. It's um, because maybe there is an interest in a place where someone, say in South Africa, it was a young curator who knew my work and just invited me on a research trip initially. And I visited a lot of archives, including the, uh, the ANC archives, and basically I decided I can't do work here. There is no place for me to make work. I don't know why I should make work in these archives. And it was only when I stepped into the botanical garden and this kind of longer European history sort of came in and echoed with what I'd encountered in the archives, I felt like, okay, well, it's still all here, this European history, and this is where it began. This is where the oppression began. And, um, and then I returned basically over a period of two years, over several months, to make work, um, and also, of course, exhibited there. And um, so it's usually like this. It's, uh, yeah, it's long periods of time, and, and, and it's, it's kind of an invitation, um, I suppose, which, which is important, like what it means to be invited somewhere and to be a guest. It's not, yeah, it, it's quite a specific position.